Welcome to Open Your Bible. I'm Mark Rutland. I'm absolutely delighted that you're joining me for this study of God's Word. In particular, we're studying the life and leadership of King David. It's just fascinating. I can't get enough of reading about, studying about, and teaching about the life of this great, complicated man. And I'm glad that you've decided to join me. Now, see if you can close the doors, shut yourself in, get that extra cup of coffee. Take some time now, just you and the Word of God. If you've got something to write with, make some notes. I think you're going to love this study today as we're talking about King David, whom we've been studying now for several weeks. And also, I have a guest with me this week. I'm delighted to have him back. He's been with us before several times, and it's a wonderful blessing to have him here. Precious young man, a businessman, a pastor. This is David Hackman from New Hope Church in Lawrenceville, Georgia. Pastor, welcome back. Dr. Mark, great to be here with you again. Uh, really enjoying this series, really enjoying getting into uh, King David's life and kind of learning it and um, seeing it through your eyes and learning it. How Thank it you. It's a joy to, to have you here. You're, you're a, a kind of a multifaceted guy yourself. You're in a responsible position in the corporate world, very That's high right. up in a, in a major interstate company in, in, in uh, finance. That's right. And you're also... Uh, one of the lead pastors at New Hope Church in Lawrenceville. You have a Romanian background. That's right. Many of people in your church are Romanian, though many are not. We have a good mix. Uh, young families just trying to raise up our families in, that, in, in, in a culture that sometimes is very challenging. Uh, we've uh, been at it for about a year now, and man, we're just thankful to God. Um, uh, seeing the maturity and the growth and the love for one another, the fellowship has been a blessing. Wonderful. So I've got a multifaceted multi-talented guy named David who's helping me study a multifaceted and multi-talented guy named David. <laughs> so I'm glad you're here. Last week we talked about, we, we left David, he had just fled from uh, Ramah where Samuel was and gone inexplicably to Gath. That was an absolutely astonishing decision. And, and I, I, I've been studying probably through my lifetime and, and leadership and Bible teaching, I've probably studied the life of David as much or more than, than any person except for Jesus. And I'm fascinated wow. with David. And this one decision to go to Gath is, is, is absolutely amazing to me. I, Almost as like he's driving on the highway and gets, wrong, gets off at the wrong exit. That's, exa <laughs> that's a good analogy. He's, and he should have kept driving or maybe made a U-turn. but And not by mistake. Right. It's like he, he's driving down the highway, to use your analogy, he's driving down the highway... And, he's, and he sees an exit sign for the town where he's hated more than <laughs> anywhere else in the whole world. It's the hometown of Goliath. He killed Goliath in public in front of the whole Philistine army. He has killed hundreds. He's already responsible for the death of hundreds of Philistine soldiers. They know him. They hate him. They despise him. He's driving down the highway escaping Saul, and he sees the sign Exit 19B for Gath. <laughs> <laughs> Let me pull off here. Right. <laughs> right. Why don't I go to Gath? Gosh. Where, where they hate me. And he goes to Gath. And of course, immediately, they arrest him. Right. And throw him into prison. And he knows they're going to kill him. So David remembers a Philistine superstition that believes that insane people are cursed by God. And if you kill them, the curse will come on you. So it's bad luck, in a sense, to kill somebody that's crazy. And by the way, that is, that is uh, a ubiquitous um, myth in, in many, many cultures. So, uh, so David feigns madness. He's eating dirt. He's foaming at the mouth. He's babbling crazy stuff. And they uh, drive him out of gas. They say, get this, the king, Achish, says, get this guy out of here. I don't want this crazy man in my, in my city. I don't want him here. You get this crazy Jew. Get him out of here. Drive him out. And so they, they hit him with stones and drive him out of the city, feigning madness. David, imagine what a humiliating moment that must have been for him. I mean, he, so you said it in previous um, teachings so he's, he's lost his wife, his family. He's Michael is gone. Has he's even run away. been given to another man. His best friend is his is, is, is enemy's son, right? Saul's right. son. And, and now he's eating dirt. And he's probably saying, God, I think you made a mistake with that anointing. Yeah, don't you he, think? He has the, those doubts and he's probably... 
I think that's a very good observation. He, he's, he must be now thinking back to that night that Samuel came to his father's house, Jesse's house, right. in Bethlehem, poured oil on his head and anointed him and said, you'll be the next king of Israel. Right. He has been lifted up to Saul's right hand, married Saul's daughter, become an object of controversy, even hatred, a huge celebrity. He, he, he won Israeli idol. <laughs> American Idol, Israeli he, he's, Idol. He's, he's the winner of Israeli Idol. He wins it. People, the women in town are singing songs about David. Now he has to flee Saul. He is, he is alone, defenseless, and the humiliation of pretending to be crazy until they hit him with stones and drive him out of town like a mad dog. And now he's all alone in the wilderness. And I think you're right. There must have been that moment where David says, is, is, is this real? Right. Is God still with me? I think that happens for many of us. When we receive a dream, a vision from God, and it just seems like it gets further and further away. Think, think about the life of Joseph, who receives this dream from God that he will be a, a person of high, a high official, his family will bow before him, that he'll bless them, take care of them in some way. And his family rejects him, despises his dream. His brothers sell him into slavery, throw him into a pit, get him out of the pit, sell him into slavery. He's taken behind an Ishmaelite caravan all the way to Egypt where he's resold like a used car. He's lifted up to become the chief executive of the household estate of a, of a wealthy Egyptian aristocrat whose wife, falsely accuses him, that's very important, falsely accuses him of attempted rape. He's thrown into prison where he stays for years until he is lifted up to translate the dream of Pharaoh and he becomes the number two most powerful man in the world. Egypt's the, the world. dominant political power in the world. Yes, in the world. And, he, and Joseph becomes that. His family flees the famine in Israel, comes to Egypt, not recognizing him, they bow before him, and the dream is fulfilled. It's, it's an amazing story, and I've seen it repeated over and over and over again in the lives of great leaders, this roller coaster effect. But if they hold on to the dream of God and wait, God will bring it to pass in his own way. It's, 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 it's a, a, a very common story that somebody gets almost further and further away from the, from the dream until God makes it happen. From that position, from that CEO, from that vice president, but all of a sudden it's that dark horse, that story that goes through the valley of the shadow of death. Exactly. And, and it just kind of just catapults you into holding on to the truth. So working in corporate America, one of the things that so um, uh, made my head just really kind of understand what it takes to succeed is, uh, yeah, God's given me smarts. He's given me wisdom. But one of the things I get told often and often and often is, I trust you. Mm. I know you're going to tell me the truth. I know if it's not convenient. I know you're not going to embarrass me. I know you're going to help me to look good. And I trust you. And more than anything, if, um, if I can say something to uh, young men, young women working in corporate America, wonderful, is, you know, not just be a team player, would be someone that they can trust you. To be a man or a woman of integrity is, is huge. And that's helped me leaps and bounds in my career. Uh, and that's, that's one of those things that it's kind of funny. Mom and dad always taught you. Tell the truth. Be a person of character and integrity. That's right. And, and promotion cometh from the Lord. Let God lift you up in his own time and in his own way. But if you, if you lust for the position and you fight for it and you try to strive for it, you may actually set yourself back. If you wait on God, even in, the, even in a pit or a, or a prison, God still can take you to the palace. And that's true. what happened for Joseph. Now, David doesn't go to a pit. He, doesn't, he has been to a prison right. in Gath, but he doesn't go to a pit, but he flees into the Judean wilderness. Now, that's kind of the briar patch for David because he's grown up in the Judean wilderness. He knows it like the palm of his hand. He knows every, every crevice and nook and cranny. And, and so he flees into the Judean wilderness and he knows of a great cave, Adullam, the cave of Adullam. And he goes there 
and hides out, and he kind of becomes this desert hermit bandit, living alone and living by his wits. And so there's these stories. People say, hey, you know, we think David came to our town last night, and he, he was in my garage, and he got some stuff, and, you know, this kind of thing. But he's living alone. But the word of it begins to get around in all of the villages that David is out in the wilderness. Now, remember, he was the second most famous person in the country and, and known to be a skilled warrior. And so the word gets around that he's out in the cave of Adullam. And so people begin to say, I'm going out to David. But these are not the best and the brightest. <laughs> who, who leaves? The, the, the Bible says tax dodgers, people that are behind in their taxes to Saul, the malcontents, it actually says malcontents. So people who are unhappy with their life, unhappy with their jobs, maybe unhappy in their families, maybe unhappy with their wives, tax dodgers, and people that are in trouble in some way. So this is a pretty rough crew. And they begin to drift out into the wilderness and find David. And they become his, what is called in Hebrew, geborim. The geborim are his trusted uh, warriors. They're David's personal army. 600 soldiers. And Almost like a bodyguard, would you say? That is, that's a good, that's good. Like a bodyguard, but, but because there's so many of them, 600, it's actually a highly skilled, very lethal, light cavalry unit. David f forms them into a into a very dangerous band of guerrillas. And, and David is the leader of them. So they have left Israel. They've left their background. Their loyalty is not to Israel. Their loyalty is to David. David. See, that's a good story because it's guys and families and people who need a second chance, who need a third chance. And they're saying, I can't get this from that's my right. people. I can't get this from my family. But I know a guy. I know a guy. I know a man. I know a man who, a man of God who, he's out there. And I think I can get my second chance with him. That's a great that's So a their great connection story. is to David. Yeah. And they are ferociously loyal. And these 600 guys stay with David really basically throughout his life. And they, they are his palace guard, his bodyguard, a, a light cavalry unit. And we know about these people. Later on, it says that these guys were ambidextrous. David trained them to fight with either hand because he realized if I'm fighting with my sword and somebody wounds my arm, I'm, I'm done for. But what if they wound my arm and I can throw the sword to the other hand and fight just as well? So they can shoot bows and arrows, use slings, use spears, both, both hands. These are very dangerous dudes. And their total loyalty is to David. They don't have a contract. They don't have law. They're outlaws. And, and they are totally connected to David at Adullam. Now, there's a, a, there is a person that surfaced earlier in the story, and I, remind, I want to remind you of him, Abiathar. Do you remember who Abiathar the is? The priest at, at Nob, was it? That's it. The priest at Nob. And he's the son of the man who gave David Goliath's sword and bread, and Saul came and killed that man and all the other priests, but Abiathar escaped. So where does Abiathar go? He's going to show up at David's camp. He comes to David. Yeah. Now, Abiathar is a complicated guy. So just keep this in your mind, in the back of your mind. And that is that Abiathar has mixed feelings about David. On the one hand, Abiathar's father and David were, were good friends. Ahimelech and, and David were good friends. And so he has that connection. He goes to David out of some sense of loyalty, but deep down inside, there's a feeling of resentment toward David that shows up later in life in a very terrible way. Can you, can you imagine what the source of that resentment might be? His dad, his, his dad getting killed. He probably blames it on David. Sure. He, he, he feels deep inside, if David did not come to Nob and gotten the sword of Goliath and gotten bread, his father would still be alive. So he knows that it was Saul's injustice. He knows that it was Saul's soldiers that killed his father. 
But deep inside, he harbors this resentment that if David had not ever come to Nob, his father would, Saul wouldn't have killed his so dad. So it's almost he, like he never forgives. That's exactly He never right. forgives. He, he didn't, and he it didn't doesn't, allow it. It doesn't surface for years. It doesn't surface for years. Wow. But it's a, it's a cautionary tale for us that if you go into a relationship with, with conflicted emotions and you have things inside of you that you don't really deal with, that you don't really forgive, that can abscess. It can sink way down inside of you and abscess to the point where actually it can surface later in a, in a terrible way and do you awful damage, though it's been, it's been like a disease that's opportunistic. And it lays inside your blood for years and years and years and surfaces over here. And, and it causes a biothar later to be destroyed, much later. We'll come to that. So if you're a business leader or an executive or a church pastor or a youth pastor, how, do you, how, do you, how can you guard against that? You know, you're giving these guys second chances and you know that they're the outcasts, they're the malcontent, but, you know, they're, they're coming to you. Is there any way to maybe kind of see that or guard against it? Or? Okay, you've shifted the point of view to David. Right. Okay, what does David do about Abiathar? Is that the point? That's right. Well, it's a great, it's a great challenge. The thing is this, deceitful above all things is the human heart. Yeah. And, and you can't see into somebody else's heart. So Abiathar comes to David. He says, I love you. I know you were friends with my dad. I'm here and I'm loyal to you. And I've, I had to flee Saul and I'm here. David accepts him. Now, what I would say is this. Sleep with one eye open. <laughs> and I always say this to pastors about people who, who get in rebellion and leave their churches. And they go off and do something. Okay, they start some little church and it fails. So not all of them, but some of them will straggle back and say, okay, we made a mistake and we want to come back and we want to join your church. Is what I always say. Take them back. Receive them. Right. But remember the situation and, and hold it a little bit incautious. People who left you once might leave you again. And just don't be fully and completely trusting and naive. Take them back, receive them, but just have that one little entry in your diary where you date <laughs> this moment. And, and David, does, David is incautious. D if David has one great strength, every leader, um, pastor, every leader's strength is also a weakness. And David's, one of David's great strengths is loyalty. He is, he is ferociously loyal and he is particularly loyal to leaders in his, in his association. David remains loyal to Saul when Saul is trying to kill him. That's always boggled my, that's always made me, it, how, how, how is, how is that possible? It's almost like a. It's a testimony to David's good grace in the first place, but it's also a testimony to David's commitment to the thing that I will not pull down somebody that God has lifted up. If God, if God wants to pull him down, let him pull him down. Right. And God pulls Saul down, all the way down. But David says, I'm not putting my hand to it. So David is loyal to Abiathar, takes him back, accepts him, receives him. But, but at the same time, we know, because we've read the rest of the story, if David <laughs> had known the script, he wouldn't have trusted him. But, uh, but Abiathar has these conflicted emotions toward David, and it doesn't surface for years and years. Now... David uh, is approached by some people from a village called Keala. And they, they come to David and say, we're surrounded by the Philistines. It's interesting. They come to David. And they don't they, go to their king. They don't go to their king. And they come to David and say, come and rescue us. Let me tell you two things. One is, they're not sure of Saul's motives. They don't know if Saul will come and help them. Secondly, they're not sure of Saul's capacity of his professionalism. What they know is David is one great soldier. And, that, and the word of this 600 unit cavalry unit, this is uh, Mosby's Raiders. These are, these are some very, very dangerous dudes. And they know that if there's anybody that can save them, it's David and the Geborim. And so they come to David and David comes and beats the Philistines, rescues them, 
and comes to live in their village. Now, this is the, <laughs> that complicated aspect of David's life. They now, you, have you ever seen the old Western movie where the, there's some bad guys that come to town? So the, the guys in town, the town council, hire a gunslinger to come yes. and kill the bad guys. Yes, you're right. right. They, he kills all the bad guys. Now, what's the problem? The gunslinger. The gunslinger. He's in town. <laughs> He's in town. Now, okay, the gunslinger got the bad guys out. What do we do about the gunslinger? Okay, <laughs> so David, come, they hire David. He comes in, kills the Philistines, drives them out, and comes and lives in their town. Now, what's their problem? They have, the gun- they have <laughs> David. 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 <laughs> what do we do about David? So they go to Saul, and they say, you want David? We know where he is. Now, think of this. They didn't go to Saul to get rid of the Philistines. They go to Saul to get rid of David. And so the Lord speaks to David and says, you got to get out of here. These people will betray you. David asks, goes to God and says, will they betray me? And and God says, yes. (laughs) And so he flees. David takes his soldiers. They leave Calah. They go to the wilderness of Ziph. And they're hiding out there. It's a forest, a, a wilderness area. There are people who live in the area. And again... They betray him. They go to Saul and say, look, we know where David is. You got to figure they played the odds. Yeah. David's got this cavalry unit, but Saul's got the whole army. David's, maybe, maybe the stories about the anointing of David are real. Maybe they are, but we know who the king is. So they play the odds. They go to Saul and they betray David. And David has to take his cavalry unit and flee now again from Ziph. Now, he goes to En Gedi. I've been to En Gedi many times. En Gedi means the, um, a, a, a spring of the deer, or probably what it really means is ibex. And David goes to this remote area of En Gedi. It's down between, it's between um, Jerusalem and the Dead Sea. It's very wilderness. There's a spring there, but it's wilderness. I just, I just want you to think, David, uh, Pastor, about this, about where David is now. Everybody in his life has betrayed him. Wow. Everybody, and if they haven't betrayed him, they're at least lost to him. David takes his parents and takes them across the river into Moab and puts his parents in Moab because they're living in Bethlehem. He doesn't want Saul to go down and kill them. So he stashes them over to Stashes them with the Moabites. So he, he takes, he can't see his parents. He, his wife, Michael, has been given to another man. So he has, he has no woman, he has no wife, he has no life. His father-in-law would kill him on sight. His best friend, Jonathan, loves him, but there's nothing Jonathan can do. He either has to rebel against his dad, and that would break Jewish law in every way, Honor thy father and thy mother, which is right before the Lord. If he turns against his dad in rebellion and goes and joins David's army, he's now a rebel. So Jonathan is in an absolutely untenable position. He doesn't have Jonathan. He doesn't have Michael. He doesn't have Saul. He doesn't have his parents. He has been betrayed by a city that he rescued. He has been betrayed by the people at Ziph that he did nothing to. He, he has nothing except these 600 soldiers. It's, it, it must have been a moment in David's life when he felt completely adrift. And he, all he has is these, these 600 soldiers. And who are they? Outcasts. Outcasts. Malcontents. Tax dodgers, like you said. Malcontents, tax dodgers, outlaws. So David is now... Look at the role. We talked about this roller coaster. He's unknown, anonymous, a shepherd boy, a general, a giant killer, the king's son-in-law, flees alone, goes to Gath. Now he's built back up. He becomes the leader of a 600-unit, very, very powerful cavalry unit, now rejected by Keilah, rejected by Ziph. His parents are in Moab. This this effect in David's life. Now listen to this. If you're going to lead, you, one, anyone, is going to lead effectively over the long run, 
you have to be able to trust God in the mountaintops and in the valleys. Mm. You, have, you have to know life is not a straight line from birth to success. <laughs> there, there are going to come those moments, those setbacks, those terrible times when, when every resource that you've depended on can be gone in a moment. The one thing that cannot be gone, God himself. And that's the secret of David's life. He clings to God alone in the wilderness, alone in the cave of Adullam. God constantly becomes David's resource and friend. When David has no one else, later in the Psalms, David writes, even though my parents should desert me, the Lord will lift me up. David's heart and soul is so inclined toward God, so dependent on God. And that even in David's sins, that's what sets David apart from Saul. Wow. David is, David is a man totally dependent upon God. Is that what draws when the New Testament says he was a man after God's heart? That's it. It, it kind of pushes to that de definition, that defining moment that even through his trials, even through his... Even through his sins. Even through his sins. That's he had that desire for God, I guess. That's exactly right, Pastor. The, the, the defining characteristic of David's life and leadership was his absolute inclination to believe in, trust, and depend upon God. And that's where we all are. Sometimes we tend to forget it. But the truth is, trust in God. Lean not to thine own understanding. God will take care of you. God bless you, my friend. Keep your Bible open.